just interesting how that works. So one of the things I did is instead of trying to win the match and say, going into day three, I'm up by 60 points or 40 points. I'm saying, nope, today I'm up by zero points. Obviously, in the back of my mind, I'm not going to say, hey, let's take one pass in this swinger. I'm going to take two, right? But in the day, you're trying to win it, and it stay, you stay more in it. And that helped a lot this year. But uh, I yeah. like that. So, yeah, the instant – the instant you have that conscious thought, it's impossible for you to get into the zone. Mm -hmm. It's like, we talked about this before on previous podcasts, when you're shooting a stage and you hit that tiny far steel and go, holy crap, I just hit it. Mm -hmm. Then you just had a conscious thought and now right. everything else falls apart. You miss your reload, you're throwing mics. Totally. It's a mess. It is you a mess. You cannot have conscious thought. Yeah, you cannot have conscious thoughts. I think the subconsciousness is also a range, like- uh, I guess people today like to use the word spectrum, I guess. Uh, but like, it's a range of like how subconscious you are. Like on most stages, I probably seem like a medium level of subconsciousness, but like the stages you really connect and that's probably more of a high level of uh, high uh, subconsciousness on a stage. But I've started really to think about, hey, what did I do on the stages where I was just so locked in and trying to take those things and apply them to all the different stages. So the same, and that happens when you have the same process, you can consistently do, you know, subconscious thinking on stages. Yeah, and I'm not saying you're not having conscious thoughts. It's just that oh, those yeah, conscious yeah. thoughts are pre-programmed to just happen right. naturally. Mm -hmm. But the instant you sort of become internal and start thinking, oh, I just hit that, or yeah. getting excited <laughs> or celebrating a victory or having some conscious thought that wasn't planned, that's yes. when you start to have issues. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about your movement a little bit. Yep. I noticed that you were having some vertical movement, mm -hmm. you know, in the beginning and you fixed it. And now yeah. it's, you're directing all of your energy horizontally. So mm -hmm. how did you overcome that? How did you break yep. that habit? So everything that I did was movement or a lot of the movement developments came between 2019 nationals and uh, area two that year. And I just like, like just looked at everything possible that was out there. There's a bunch of videos, watch people's movement. I really started being analytical and putting things on the clock and seeing what worked and seeing what didn't. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people will, will, uh, will, I guess it starts with a shooting stance. I mean, I believe most people have their feet either in line or which is really bad because you get pushed back with recoil. And mm -hmm. so most people then take the right foot and have the front toe of the right foot in line with the midline of their left foot. And that's pretty good, but you can still get kind of rocked back a little bit. So I take my mm -hmm. right foot and put it in the back uh, of the heel of my left foot. So I have more offset, so you'll be more stabilized. And then most people are kind of straight up and down. And then I'm uh, rotating at my hips forward to set a more aggressive angle because over time when you shoot, I guess uh, the audio listeners can't really see this, but if I'm straight up, straight down, I shoot, I'm gonna go bang, 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 bang. Eventually I'm gonna be like, kind of like in, not inverted, it's but pushing you back. back, pushing you back. Yeah. So what I have to do is if I start, if I start straight up and down, I end back. If I start over top, I at worst would end straight up, but I try to maintain this angle forward, this aggressive angle forward. And then I'll tie this together. I promise. Basically <laughs> with the angle with the angle with my feet and then getting low to the ground uh, allows me the best stance possible to mitigate recoil, uh, you know, the, be the best that you can, right? And deaden the recoil the best that you can. And so with that stance, that is my USPSA stance. Most people have just a shooting stance and their feet are basically right together and they're straight up and down and they rock back with recoil. The problem is, is if you're not in the same position every single time, the gun is going to behave differently every single time. Mm -hmm. You know what's going to happen. It leads to a lot of shooting problem. That's a physical fundamental error. And so that's like the first thing I do like with everyone. Everyone I teach is, is making sure that physical fundamentals are, are repeatable and consistent every single time you need that. But how that plays in the movement is I want to be in that stance every single time. And so when you go into position and use the, the energy, uh, you deaden your energy by going down and up, like you're, you're, you're running low and then you go up, you do help slow yourself down. And that is, you know, one uh, possible entrance technique. I don't use it, but as far as staying low and then going up, you can kind of use that energy to, to, to like deaden the energy. But then the problem is that you're not in a good shooting stance. And so for me, 
you're not in a good shooting stance. And then to get out of position, you need to drop down and mm-hmm. then push out. And then you get up again, costs you time and moves yep. your gun. Then you gotta get down and push out again. So you're going up and down, up and down, up and down. I call and, it the pogo. <laughs> yeah, the pogo. Yeah, I like that. So that's a good word for it. So you're losing time, it's inefficient. Uh, and also you're not in the best shooting stance. And so for one of those two reasons, it's out. You can't use it. Um, there is the advantage of it does kind of sort of help you kill some of the energy entering a position. But I think there's a lot better methods to doing that. Uh, obviously, I, I feel like you would agree with that based on what I, I see. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a much better entrance techniques than just going up. And so I, it's just conscious thoughts. And so I just would put a video. Uh, there's a baseball app. I don't have it on my phone because I, I got a different phone. But there's a baseball app where it's a loop where it will you can turn your camera on <clears> and shoot it. And then you go back. By the time you're back, it like replays. It's like, like it's in time. and doesn't save it on phone. Oh, big boomerang. Yeah. Now I just film myself. So I have it, but you film yourself, you go back and say, Hey, look, I popped up. Let's not do that. And then you focus on what do I need to do to fix it? And so everything that I've ever fixed has been conscious effort on that task. So what I do with that is I just said, Hey, let's, let's just enter positions. We're entering positions a hundred times today. We're going to film it and we're going to do it until we get it right. And when we get it right, we're going to do it some more. We're going to dry fire it. So um, it's all just con- conscious effort at something. I guess with movement, there's a lot more things going on your arms and legs, but like when I, whenever I teach uh, like short shuffle or medium shuffle, technically uh, for the distance you're using for medium shuffle, there's so many different things going on. Your right arm moving this, you're moving out of position, your right mm-hmm. elbow, this, this, this. And so everyone always is like, oh, there's too much thing, too many things yeah. going on. And say, hey, in this next run, I want you to focus on one thing. I want to yeah. focus on driving with your elbow. Okay. They do the driving elbow. I said, all right. And I never say this, obviously, but everything looked awful, but the elbow was better. Okay. Yes. So he does it every single time. You know, he just says, all right, next run, I want you to focus on setting this angle and pushing out. And guess what? The elbow is not going to move how it's supposed to, but then they fix their lower body. And so you individually pick out those little tiny things. You can, you can fine tune it quite a bit. Yeah. And you have to keep rotating through and you know that, well, even then, as you're trying to do these new things, things that you're yeah. normally good at start falling up. apart and then you start messing those up and you're like but i know how to do that thing i'm trying to yes. learn something new and then everything else just falls apart exactly so you got to focus on one thing at a time like yesterday i went skiing for the first time in five years with my family my mom's a really good skier and and she said one thing and i said all right i'm gonna work on that and i started doing it really good and then she told me another thing to work on and i was working on that and she's like but now you got to do this i'm like mom you're 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 making me <laughs> real mad right now because this is one of the things i talk about in shooting and so on the chair lift up i said Here's how we do it in shooting, right? If you got a grip problem, we're, we're focusing on left hand at a time. Maybe your right hand was good. Now your right hand's bad. That's fine. You fix one thing at a time, consistent conscious effort. And then eventually you can try putting it all together. And then you, you basically hit the lowest common denominator, the one that's not working the most. You focus on that one. You keep building it up. This is, this is like what Dex Bradley from the AMU was talking about on our show yesterday. He said, mm-hmm. it's like a bunch of balloons in a room and each yep. balloon is a skill and you're trying to keep them all off the ground Yep. And you can only hit one balloon at a time. Yes, exactly. And that, I mean, that's kind of the training system or sort of builds into the training system that I use is if I shoot a match, I then write down exactly what I need to go work on and I hit those skills first. But I have a pretty routine uh, dr- drills and skills stuff that I focus on. So I can, I basically sectionalized every possible skill there is to work on to a very small level, like grip. I have like three or three to five, like main things that I practice and, and, little abilities and skills and different parts of it that I then do drills for. So normal season of practice, I just go through all those things, just start to finish, start to finish, start to finish. And, uh, but as far as like in the mid season, it's what did I just do in a match wrong and let's hit those uh, and fix them. Yeah. And then if I got more time, I'll go through them again. Okay. So your practice, this, this jump into your practice. So yeah. your practice um, like a month leading up to the match, how many rounds are you firing per week? How many times do you draw mm-hmm. firing? How many times are you live firing? Yeah. What does your practice look like? Yeah, I always love this because everyone always like expects me to shoot a bunch, be like practicing a bunch, and it's yeah, like you shoot a million rounds a month, right? Yeah, a million rounds a month. <laughs> but I you know, have a job, uh, and you're a student, and yeah. you're trying to shoot. Yeah, the problem is classes. Yeah, yeah. When I got time, the problem is it's like time for me right now is like crazy, and I I'm I, I'm 21. Uh, I'm real young, and I, I'm still trying to have a good time with my friends, uh, see people, hang out, like I'd be at school, and so like shooting has always just been like my training. And so I've had to get pretty efficient with it, like between school, work, family, everything going on. There's just like not a lot of time for things. And so, uh, I mean, when I was in school, I was living on campus and, uh, couldn't have my gun there for the past two years now. Yeah. For 
yeah, past two years, I've been able to have my gun in a safe lock because I'm not on campus anymore, which is real nice for dry fire. But uh, I still need to drive at least 30 minutes there and back to get to a range. So like a, a range trip is going to take me two to three hours. So it's a big deal for me to go to practice. So I do a lot of dry fire. Like in the season, ideally, I want to be dry <laughs> firing like at least every day or at least every other day and ideally every day, like leading up to a match. Like if I had if I had an area two in two weeks from now, I dry fire every single day leading up to it. The problem is if you try to cram too much training close to it, like you're going to have problems that you just cannot fix and you know are not going to be fixed. So I try to plan like ahead, like, I'll probably start training very seriously three months out from nationals. And that's like real it's for me, it's realistic. And I know that I can do pretty darn well with it. And I try to shoot as much as possible close to the event. So uh, I can like, get into like repeatable processes and everything like that. But ideally I'd shoot every day of the week. I dry fire every day of the week. I shoot a thousand, hundred thousand rounds a year. I do all that sort of stuff, but I don't because life happens, right? I'm not a professional shooter. I've basically chosen not to take that path. Uh, for a variety of different reasons, but uh, so I'd, I'd love to do more and it's frustrating at times, but one of the things I consistently stay away from is saying, making it an excuse. Like I really try very hard to never say, oh, well, he, he, he's going to be, he, he beat me for this. I, I mean, his last time I lost like 2019, like I would never be like, he beat me because he lives on a range. He can shoot whenever he wants. He has all the ammo he wants. He has all the guns he wants. They give him free guns and optics. And right. So I never do that, but so I, you know, I'm, I'm very realistic with it. I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. Also very fortunate situation of where I can go practice and train. But anyways, back to the specific question, most time to lead up to open nationals, three months out, I'll start dry firing every day, every other day when I have time, I try to get my hands on the gun, try to make the gun just an extension of my hands, mm -hmm. whereas I can just look at a spot and the gun goes to it. And, uh, you know, when, when the adrenaline's pumping, when you're shooting the stage, that I think is a big X factor of being familiar with what you can get away with and having the gun be real comfortable in your hands. So uh, I think being very familiar with the gun helps a ton of kind of like an X factor, kind of like an additional unquantifiable skill, I guess, at some, some points. Um, but yeah, I dry fire every other day, uh, leading up to match for three months. And then realistically, most weeks I get out once, one time a week and I shoot some days it's 250 rounds and I'm, I'm just done. And then some days I'm really, really, really shooting a bunch. I'm shooting like 400 rounds, but I, I cannot remember the last time I had a, a practice session over 400, 400 rounds I'm trying to think. No, I really haven't had a practice session over 400 rounds. So I shoot probably 20,000 rounds a year. Yeah. I think you get to the point of diminishing returns after 100%. about 400 rounds or so. I, I mean, if you're agree. having fun, keep going, but yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I would love to do five days a week with a hundred rounds rather than, you know, one practice session with 500 rounds easily. So yeah. you get more processing time too. If you do too many That's things it. all at once, then it's, it's just going to disappear. It's not going to work its way into your long-term memory. Yeah, I kind of uh, joked about it last year, saying when I was warming up, that, like people will be burning like five mags and I go over there with 10 rounds. I'm just like, <clears> bang, 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 bang. All right, drop, bang, bang. All right, bang, 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 bang. I'm done. They're like, you want to shoot more? I'm like, no, I'm wasting my good bullets, right? My <laughs> focus energy. But there is some facts to that, you know, some science to that. Yeah, yeah I think some sure. of the guys as well are like, well, I'm shooting 500 rounds three, four times a week. Um, mm -hmm. I should be good, right? It should be, should be training. Yeah. But I think some of them, just kind of you're just wasting you're just wasting ammo and making noise past completely agree. past that point yeah i completely agree there are some people um oh, I, I guess i don't say it like that but there are people that i know let's use two people for example i got one guy who shoots you know 500 round or two two practices with 250 rounds a week and i got one guy that shoots every single day 500 rounds and that one guy beats the other guy every single time it's because they don't know how to train they don't know what to train and it's a big problem and I guess what that person needs to do is they need to go get a class and they know what they're bad at, what to work on and how to train. Like that's the steps, but not everyone necessarily wants to do that. Some people want to go to the range and burn 500 rounds for fun, just, you know, whatever, but I'm into the very focused training. And so I, I break down all the different skill sets that I want to train, all the different things I want to train. Um, uh, and I just hit every single one of them and I'm very, very just focused on it. And uh, I mean, every once in a while, I find myself like usually when I'm getting into like the array section where I'll just go and set up an array and just shoot it all day long, which that's not very good practice. But every once in a while, you know, got to give yourself a little bit of grace there and have a little bit of fun with the training. But usually it's it's not as like glamorous as the Instagram videos and stuff go. Like I'm not shooting field courses in practice. I'm shooting three targets for like two hours and shooting 400 rounds and just like grinding it out, like getting nutty with the level of technicality that I'm, I'm focusing on. It's not always fun, but uh, 
very focused training for sure. Yeah, you should be getting yeah. feedback from every bullet you send on range. Definitely. Every um, bullet means something. 100%. Yeah. And being able to process what I can't what remember when the, last time I, when the last time a practice session was actually fun. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I had a blast. I took some new shooters to the range last week and I was like, this is fun. Like, I'm leaving the range. This is fun. But usually I'll end on like a bad rep and then I'll go home like dry fire, or do something like super shooting nerve related. But uh, yeah, it's, it's good. Scott yeah, so Green what only do you think of taking... shoots 50 rounds. 50 rounds? Oh, yeah. maybe that's ammo construction. I remember, I remember talking to him this summer, but uh, yeah, I mean, you don't really need much. I mean, I if, you, if ammo's a real big crunch, I would dry fire the drill. Mm -hmm. Like, so you had a drill, let's, I don't know, let's say you had an array, you had a target here, target here, dry fire a couple times yeah. with sight pictures, everything, and then shoot it once. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in that. Oh yeah, definitely working in dry fire training into your live fire is going to be way more productive way more than just, yeah. than just throwing rounds downrange for no reason are you taking a break currently or what's happening on your off season yeah i know people still mess with me like are you shooting you posting videos or anything um yeah so i guess so it, i shot usb this falls in crazy because i've been working part-time uh, it was supposed to be like 15 hours a week i've been working 20 to 28 29 at most but usually like 24 hours so i've been working 24 hours a week uh on three different days and then, uh, you know, I've, I've had class on the other two days. And so I've had finals and tests and everything. So I've been working and doing school and trying to shoot, which is not, is technically a recipe for disaster, but I've avoided all disasters and been pretty successful in all three, which has been real good with, you know, good focus energy on all of it and trying to stay sane. But uh, this fall I had open nationals, you know, with work and school and everything going on. And so I trained as much as I possibly could. I, I go shoot early in the morning before classes. I go shoot early in the morning before work, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I was like definitely training pretty hard, definitely getting like way too, too little uh, amount of sleep. Um, but after I shot open nationals, I was like big sigh of relief, like all this training, everything. And it wasn't like, oh, I don't want to go practice. I want to go practice next week if I had copious amounts of time, but I didn't. And so I actually didn't pick up my guns until area two, because it was like, bunch of midterms before and after and so i just picked up the guns dry fired i knew the exact things i needed to make sure my like you know uh there's a word for it but like uh uh it's like non non-negotiable type skills i needed to make sure i was doing i was like but I, I dry fired in the hotel the day before and i was like yep grip is good to go this is gonna be a fine match like um, this is gonna be fine and i shot fine kind of warmed up on the first day day two day three crush it but yeah, after area two, I haven't shot the guns besides twice. And one time was to chrono so I could load ammo for the single stack gun. And the other time was taking my friends out. But I think after Christmas, I get back and I'm going to get right back after it. So probably uh, mid-January, I'm going to get back to like normal, very consistent training one time a week, early morning Saturday and just start ripping. Hey, Grant, you had a question about cross-training, right? Yes. Okay. So cross-training, basically shooting a gun that's harder to shoot than your match gun as a way of making it seem easier to shoot your match gun. What do you think of that? Yeah, so I like cross training, but I don't necessarily think of it as, um, okay, I shoot, I don't, well, how would it be harder? So I guess I don't think of it as saying, okay, open's gonna be easier because I shot something else. I think there's some part of that. I, I, guess, I guess I wouldn't shoot like a, a gun that had like a heavier trigger, had like worse whatever to like make it hard, like make it easier. But I think you learn different skills. And so like when I shot an iron sight gun, when I went back to the open gun, maybe it was just kind of like, oh, I was gun so much easier to shoot, but I felt more tuned up. I feel like your, your vision is a little bit better. You're th maybe just thinking a little more clearly about it, but yeah, I went and shot the iron sight gun. And I'm going to keep that skill because I think iron sight, when you shoot dot for so long, shooting the iron sights is a skill and it's going to take a few practice sessions to be like, oh, wow, I can actually hit what I want to now. And like trying to equate what sight picture equates to what on the target is pretty hard. But yeah, I've had a lot of fun. I don't think of it as like, shooting a harder gun i think it's about learning different skills on the gun but yeah i want to be like the most well-rounded shooter right now i'm really focused on open and winning winning that but uh if time allows and if work definitely if the big thing is if work allows and kind of life allows i'm gonna shoot single stack nationals or l10 i kind of really want to shoot single stack but if everyone's shooting l10 i guess i'll shoot l10 then for a little more competition but truly i'm not shooting that for competition i'm shooting it for development of me and just fun honestly uh, for single stack. Um, but then as far as carry optics national, we'll shoot carry optics nationals. And I actually have the carry optics gun right here, uh, the CZ shadow and the X five. I'm shooting that. And I've learned a lot. I mean, I really like it. Uh, I like having recoil. I mean, I think 
I, I have a really good grip at everything. I think uh, it applies well to guns that actually have recoil uh, as opposed to the open gun. So I, <laughs> I like it. I've learned a lot of different skills or just like kind of enhance the skills or different level of skills. So I don't necessarily think it's like making your gun easier. I think it's about learning on other platforms. Yeah, I think you're okay. creating a lot more neural pathways doing that mm-hmm. because you're expanding your horizons and you're still very young. It's mm-hmm. not until about 25, I think, that we kind of slow down with our myelination a little bit. Mm-hmm. So you're creating all these neural pathways that for the rest of your life, you're going to have a much easier time coming back and revisiting or Definitely. carrying over to other things where you can take a direct path where the rest of us yeah. adults have to go like all over the place <laughs> taking shortcuts yep. or long cuts to, and you've got a shortcut. <laughs> Yeah, I like the science behind it. I, I completely agree with all that. That's really good. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, right, like, like I went skiing yesterday and, I, and my mom was like, well, this will be really interesting. I just didn't want to hurt myself is the main thing. But uh, because I skied when I was really young, I was able to get right back after it where I had another good buddy of mine go ski who'd never skied in his entire life. And I would say he's more athletic than I am and had just a terrible time. and was doing bunny slopes the entire time. And that's because I had done it when I'm younger. So uh, creating the neural pathways and everything is definitely, definitely something to do that. Okay. So do you want to settle the double action, single action versus striker fire debate now, or do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I think the jury or the, uh, the, the court or jury, whatever is out on that one. Uh, this is, I have a, I have one that's getting milled and getting trigger work done. So I'll get my optic on it and everything, but I got this pretty much what I'm going to do trigger job on it. Uh, I'm still testing the X5 and the CZ. I really like both guns a lot. I'm having a terrible time deciding. And I don't want to like buy a bunch of stuff when I don't know if I'm going to do it. So uh, I'm just trying to decide between the striker fire uh, SIG and possibly the Walther in this gun. But I mean, I shot this gun double action a couple of times. It's not terrible. I mean, like, it's not a big disadvantage. I mean, I think getting the gun that fits you the best and you like the feel and everything is really good. But I mean, I don't know. I could go shoot a, people think the Glock carry off this gun sucks. I can go shoot the Glock tomorrow and probably have the exact same results. You know, marginal difference maybe of that. Uh, it's more of a mental thing sometimes. But I don't know. I, I don't think I can settle it right now, but I don't think. I don't think it's a terrible thing. I mean, this trigger single action is objectively nicer than uh, the other other striker fired guns just normally. So, I mean, I guess if you can stomach the double action first shot, which is not that bad, I guess uh, the trigger on this is better. Well, I just tell people no one ever won a, an Ipsic match by shooting the first round very quickly. So This is very true. I like that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So you also, um, speaking of the darts, you've kind of graduated towards like a smaller dot, like a three MOA kind Mm -hmm. of thing. And then most of the guys that I speak to like the biggest massive dot that they can find. Yeah. Which is crazy. You're in South Africa. So you shoot IPSC. So like the target difficulty is probably higher. So like, okay. So if I, so some people, sometimes people will say, okay, at this, like, like this row of five yard targets. Oh man, I really wish I had iron sights. It's like, why is that? Well, you're, you're less precise with it, right? You can just slap them kind of in the middle. Whereas a dot, you may get kind of sucked into trying to aim too much in the center or whatever. And so uh, same thing kind of happens with the dot. So like if I'm shooting close up stuff, <clears throat> if I have a tiny dot, you can try to get, you accidentally get like too, uh, like aim too much, like aim too tight when you're like pretty close on the target. So like a bigger dot makes you be less precise, which would then be better at some targets close range. But when, as soon as you get far, you toss a, you know, a six, six or an eight MOA target on the, or thing on the, on the target, it's filling up the entire head box. So instead of now saying, am I left or right on the head box, it's either on the head box somewhere or off of it, which is kind of scary for me. So I like to be pretty precise with it. So this dot on here is a Delta point two, two and at 2.5 MOA. Uh, you know, it's a good dot, uh, but I really like the SIG, the SIG dots uh, better and uh, for a variety of different reasons. But no, I've always used a 2.5 or 3 MOA. Those are three. But I think because of the glass size, this is a three. So I like the three MOA. Every once in a while, I'll pick up a six. I'm like, oh, this is so nice. And then you shoot like actually hard stuff. And I want I want to grab a three right away. So yeah, I used to use a big one, but that's before I like, I just, the dot came with the gun, but yeah. So out of curiosity, where do you zero? Yeah, so I guess that's also hot topics. I, I love the, I love the hot topics. <laughs> All the hot topics. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we're talking about the dot, the the tape on the dot next. Uh, but uh, right, uh, kind of <laughs> those are training wheels, not something. Yeah, I don't know. Why, I don't know why I got looped into that. The other day, someone was making fun of the whole make it happen thing, and it was like, oh, you can put the you can put the tape. We on know the who dot, that is. Make it happen. <laughs> it's like I have never, I had never once taught this taught this technique. I've never once mentioned this technique. 
I've never once used this technique, but somehow I got associated with it. It makes no sense. Maybe just because I'm a young guy and everyone thinks it's a new young trend, but uh, I, got, I got no bad feelings for it. There's obviously, you know, joking of some sorts, but uh, I, I, I don't teach it at all or do anything like that. I haven't even tried it myself. Am I going to try it now? I guess I just got the perfect, you know, we'll, we'll poke to, to go try it and see what I think of it. But um, that's what I think on that. What was it? What was the, the other hot topic we were just on? Where do you zero? Where do you zero? Yeah, I get, I get two into the hot topic and I just, you know, blank out everything else. Uh, no, so I zero at 13 yards. Uh, I guess most commonly people do 15. Uh, but I mean, if you think about what we're shooting, like 95% or some percentage, uh, some kind of arbitrary percentage is, is real close up. And so I just went into the match and I was like, okay, do I want to be on for almost everything I'm shooting? And then just slightly maybe adjust for the 1% of different targets that are really far out. And I thought that was a pretty good dis decision because you can just be spot on for everything and make a tiny adjustment on one or two targets, maybe in the match or stage. Would you consider making a an adjustment for IPSC? Maybe I'd put it at 15 uh, I don't know if I go as far as 17, uh, but I mean, I guess what would be kind of cool is, I mean, there's no data on this, but say if you like mapped out every target at different matches and then you know, okay, I want to be zeroed for what 95% of the targets are. And maybe it's like 17 in an IPC match. I bet it probably is a range again of like 10 to 17 if you're at a USPSA match down south with a bunch of open targets at five yards versus maybe an area eight match versus maybe an area two match versus IPC world shoot. So I don't know I may change it, but I feel pretty comfortable with it. I've, I've shot some pretty far targets and it's not a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal when you start hitting no shoots or throwing them over the top, but it's pretty easy to adjust, but definitely. I can guarantee you'll have 50 yard targets at the world shoot. Yeah. And for the 50 yard target, I just aim bottom of the alpha and they go right in the center. And it's just like, for the three, I'd rather just adjust for it, but I may go further for IPC, maybe 15, maybe, maybe I, uh, kind of dollar cost average that one and go 15 and then 16 or something like that. But yeah, yeah they the also have these little the tiny guns. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> they also have these little tiny square plates and they put them out Ooh. fairly far and they're painted all different colors. Sometimes they're even painted Brown with a Brown background. Oh, nice. nice. And sometimes they have, sometimes the targets are all different colors. So you may want to practice shooting that just to get outside yeah. your comfort zone a little bit that's perfect luckily uh, there's a lot of cowboy action guys and like skill shooters locally so i'll get like green red brown different painted colors and stuff so i do practice on that a little bit but I i'm ready for all that i want i want all that i want all the difficulty i want all the hardness i'm, I'm ready to go for it but definitely consideration as far as zero goes uh, to look at so yeah yeah the yeah. general rule of thumb in epsic is zero 25 and just hold over for everything yeah, I don't know if I like that though. Holding over for everything, I'd rather hold under for a few than hold over for everything. I don't know. That's kind of my thought on it. Twenty five seems so far, but it's not. It's not oh, I got to do some math on this. It's going to really I'm, throw you off on yeah. close partials with no yeah. shoots. Yeah, so if you're not used to it. On it close and then just aim a little low at the far stuff, which can kind of be nutty when you have a partial and you're aiming into the partial. But I, it has to be pretty far for me to do that. And then, yeah, I, I don't know. I like, I like what I'm doing now. It's worked pretty well. But I think it's just one of those personal preference things of I'm yeah. used to my dot at this distance and I'm not going to change it. Yeah, I think there's a quite a bit of that, but then also like objectively, is there a range that's more suitable for one than the other? So uh, but yeah, I like it. That'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Yeah, it'll be good. Uh, I, mean, <laughs> I'm, I so, want the harder matches. I want the further targets. So I'm, I'm, I'm down to apply that to some things, but uh yeah, I mean, it works so far on the far targets that I have shot. I shot my alphas on it, so uh, I don't know. But right. I'm definitely open to change. I'm not. I'm. I am so against staying hard and fast and locked into something. Like, I guess. I guess if you're you say something, I say something now, like if I said like, "Oh, I'm doing 13." I'm not afraid to uh, two months from now put it to 25. You know, so I don't know. I'm open to it, but everything has to. You got to have a thesis behind anything that I do with any of this stuff. I wonder if six months from now, Christian is going to look back at this and go, you <laughs> should have probably done something else. We, we may get close to 15. I don't think we're getting ever close to 20, but yeah, no, I like it. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So let's talk about the world shoot. Are you doing anything specific to prep for that? Like, no. for example, the, the walkthroughs are a little different. Have you shot it yep. before? Yeah. So I shot, uh, 
I, I talked about the excuses scene earlier, so I'm not even going to get into it. But I shot my <laughs> Nationals when I was real young, like three, three, four years ago. But that's um, in the U.S., so it's not quite the, the same. Not quite the same, yeah. I mean, what's cool, though, is I know I'm going to like IPSC better because I want yeah. – I want challenge. separation. I want the challenge. I want the separation. Uh, like if you look at, uh, you know, nationals this, this year, zone one and zone two, like the targets, like the stages, like, you know, no offense to any of the stage designers. Like I have uh, so much respect for the people that put on the matches and do the hard work because I'm not the one running the timer. I'm not the one putting the stakes in the ground. And I've done that before locally and different events and it, and it's terrible. It's really, really hard. And a lot of hard work, but I think objectively those stages were a little bit too easy and, and separating yourself is much harder. I use the example of taking, um, and not saying that I, I'm putting myself in this these shoes, but like if you took an NFL quarterback and a college quarterback, obviously the NFL quarterback is better than the college quarterback. All right, now let's prove this. If I took it, took them and I said, you're gonna throw hundred footballs through a 15 yard hula hoop. Okay. You know, the, the NFL quarterback's probably just going to barely beat the quarterback because it's not that much of a challenge. But then mm -hmm. if I put a hula hoop at 15, 25, 50, and hundred, the NFL quarterback's going to smoke the guy because he has more chances to show his elite uh, and just better than the other person's skill. So I wish they were a lot harder, but as soon as we got into zone three, I knew it was going to be game over because <clears> the first stage were very far steel and uh, other competitors took them up close, but I was confident in my, my better ability at distance to shoot very accurate. And I, you know, trusted the process of my training and everything. And I went right to the back and went one for one up until the last steal, barely called off the edge, put a pickup shot, but Besides that, I'm pretty sure I won the stage and, and separated myself the most. And it was the most technical shots, the furthest shots, kind of the hardest positions to be in. I was in a weird lean and everything. And then the rest of the stages were, you know, more technical, harder shooting. And I, I did better at that. So I think everyone's like, oh, Christian's going to go shoot IPSC and he's going to face a real big challenge or he's going to get a drop off. I'm like, if, if you know, you know that that's not the case. Like, I'm only going to be better when I have harder stages. And so that'll be cool to see. But as far as the, um, the make ready thing, that's something that really threw me off because I'm used to racking the gun, kind of gripping mm -hmm. the gun everything. So what mm -hmm. I started doing, I, did, I you know, if, it's an advantage to be able to do that stuff. So if I'm shooting yeah. USPSA, I'm going to do that. I'm not just going to be like, oh, yeah. Sorry guys, I'm better than everyone here and I need to do IPSC load. Like that's not true. Like that's that's hilarious. Like I'm not gonna do that. So if I have the option to rack the gun, do all stuff, I'm gonna do that. But uh I started doing that at local matches sometimes. But the big key the not the hack, but I go to the safety table when I'm the in the hole shooter on the deck shooter mm -hmm. and I drive far the gun and I'm like, I'm hot, like let's load the gun, let's do this, right? I've I do the same thing for yeah. Ipsic. <laughs> yeah. So it's like all about learning the stage before you get on it. So you don't need to do those last run throughs. You don't need to do last single rack and feel the gun and everything. And so, uh, yeah, I just do that ahead of time. And I can just do it, which is cool, but it just, I just learned that, but I don't try to think what else there are, there are rules. I guess running out of bounds is going to be really weird for me. I choreograph not doing that, but and then only that, having like, five to three minutes to actually walk the stage. You can't walk it the day before kind or of two minutes. Some oh. of them are two minutes. Yeah, some of them, two minutes. Yeah, that some of them you'll only get like one minute. Yeah, I actually didn't even plan this, but at Georgia State, I flew in from another match, Area 4, because I was already down south. I'm like, I need more matches or four nationals, but I didn't have a bunch of matches close to it. And I pulled up, and we were shooting in like 30 minutes. And I was like trying to load mags. My dad was like loading mags. Like, Dad, can you please load these? I'm going to run around try to look at the stages because you only had six guys in a squad, and they pasted for you. So it was just like boom, boom, boom. As soon as you mm -hmm. load your mag, you shoot the next stage. And so we only had four-minute walkthroughs. And for that, uh, I, it was almost like, oh, wow, this is almost like, you know, IPSC match where I don't get much time. And luckily, they weren't too complicated, but I still have to memorize a plan on it on these yeah. little field courses. So that was kind of a test, and I, I did pretty well at it. So I, I you know, making improvements with that, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's something you should definitely be practicing. Mm -hmm. Even just at a local match, give yourself a really minimal amount of time to look at the stage, oh, come up with a plan, walk away, visualize, and then mm -hmm. go shoot. Yeah, I mean, you get your walk through when you're on deck, but mm -hmm. you have to stay behind the rear fault lines right. the day before when you show up to look at the stages and you can't yeah. really see where all the targets are all the time. And then yeah. so basically, you have you're, you're everybody that. trying to do the walkthrough within that like one to two to three minutes, whatever it might be. Yep. And you can't see or everything. 12. <laughs> or 12. Yeah. So, and especially when you have 12 guys that like want to win the match. Right. So yes, I used to get, I used to get really just like, Oh my gosh, or someone's got a better plan than me. And you know, uh, people would say different things that maybe weren't necessarily right <clears> or anything <throat> like that. And so I just said, you know what, I'm trusting myself and myself only, and maybe a few trusted friends, um, but I can only rely on myself. And so I've just been totally independent. Like this nationals, I was just 
this one and basically all last year, totally independent of my stage plans. Maybe you know, with close buddies to say, hey, what do you think of this or that? But at the end of the day, I'm making the decisions. And so mm-hmm. uh, I've gotten a lot better at that. And I like that idea. That's a great idea. I mean, going to local match and saying, I haven't shot a bunch you know, in the past couple of years, but going to local match saying I'm not walking these stages until I'm up there is a good idea. And I, so I've done that Georgia, like not on purpose, yeah. Uh, but I also done a better job of saying, uh, of doing like, all right, if I got four minutes on this stage, what am I going to do and take a plan and then maybe go back and say, do I want to change anything? And the cool thing is when I've done the four minute walkthrough versus like all day when you're walking the stages, I haven't really come up with anything too crazy. So it kind of goes to, goes to show, trust your gut, do the analysis and go through a process. And I have a pretty good process of going through it. I, I've had it, have it written down a couple of times, but it's just kind of in my head. All right, find the targets, walk around, do this. Um, but then in my practice, I do a lot of sequence training where I, I do the same targets and I pick a different sequence, but I move, I move. Mm-hmm. So I'm not like seeing them necessarily the same. And so I can pick a plan. All right, close my eyes. All right, one, two, four, three. One, two, four, three. One, two, four, three. All right, let's do it. And then just like just shooting it as best yeah. as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so another you're thing saying you're with- actually going to sorry, you're saying you're actually going to the mm-hmm. safety area. Yes. Before you're on deck and actually draw a fire. You don't do that. Down. No, me. <laughs> no, I do that. No, no, yeah, so that's exactly what I do. Yeah, no, dude, you, you should do that. That'd be, that'd be really good. I mean, one one that I do is just making sure I'm getting a good draw and a good grip. Good draw, good grip, and then it's all right. Let's draw the gun and do the first move off it if you have a big, big place. And then just visualize, okay, boom, 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 boom. Visualize it and kind of like one last check. That's exactly what I do when I shoot. Yeah, I really like that. If I'm in the hole, I'm at the safety area, Mm -hmm. basically doing my stage with the gun out. Mm -hmm. I do the exact same thing. That That (laughs) That has been a big help. See, those are things... So like things like that, like I, I think that's a great, this, this is what, this is actually an interesting topic because I think that's a great thing to do, but that's not necessarily like part of like class curriculum per se. So I, whenever I come, uh, come across those things, I just know that like, you know, like, like Grant, like, you know, you're a good shooter and everything. It's like, it's like, I, I'd be surprised that you weren't doing it. Right. And I'm not trying to pick yeah. on you anything, Right. So it's like, <laughs> even some like really good shooters, like don't do those things. And so it's like really yeah. easy to think like in a class, Oh, you guys must do that. So I started writing down a list of like, quality practice guidelines and then like little extra things like you know if we have time at the end of the day or at lunch things like that we talk about like hey have you tried this or have you tried that so uh, those things uh, just interesting that that just came up but like things like that I try to quantify and like have a process and make those more into the process than just like you know, some people go to the range like wow I had a really good day today like I wonder what I did differently it's like well what did you do differently and mm-hmm. or, or when someone's like oh wow I shot that so subconsciously like I've never been that locked in I'm like well, there's a reason why that stuff doesn't yeah. just happen. So going through the process. And so this kind of builds into the consistency. So, yeah. So another thing for you to keep in mind when you're shooting IPSC, let's say you've got 12 guys walking a stage in two minutes. Yeah. You don't have to like us from the U S we line up in order and walk through in order. Yeah. You don't have to do that. If there's a spot you're not sure about, go straight to that spot. Mm. Nice. Wait, so is that just a rule or is that just kind of eth- like how it goes? You'll see it you'll see it at the world shoot where you have a really limited amount of time you kind of have your plan but you're not sure where you can see a particular target from or something that's going to decide your plan you go directly to that spot don't even bother standing in the line just go right to that spot and then get out of there as fast as you can so other guys can get through is that a rule though i wonder is that it's not a rule Okay, yeah. Um, you you can walk the entire stage. Once the, the RO says you may do a walkthrough, you can pretty much do whatever you want on the yeah. stage. Yeah, I mean, I guess technically you could go in the front of the line and be like, line zone exists, right? But that's obviously not how... how the <laughs> well, no, you want to be polite, would, but if you just want to check friends, like yeah. one spot, if you have one problem spot you're not sure about, just dart in there just first, yeah. get there really quick, get out yeah. really quick, just and then go back see to the it, yeah. and then well, go I, to the back of the yeah, line. Yeah, I, I maybe need to get a little more aggressive with that because I feel like I always get kind of screwed over with the line. So I, I definitely got... I'm just, just just too nice and people don't always play nice <laughs> well then you get that the asian guys are like ants on a watermelon oh really they don't stand in line and they laugh at all of us for standing in a congo oh, line. really they just yeah. pop in there yeah no i haven't had too many problems with that at all uh i mean i've only I'm trying to think of the last time i have had a couple times where um i have had something go wrong like a uh, optic break or just something and i i like had the stage plan done but then i was so focused fixing something i come back and like oh you're on deck and kind of had like a two-minute walkthrough to do it so i think practicing that would be kind of a cool idea yeah mm-hmm. so in the philippines i was shooting a match with eric grafell and we yep. got this fast pass 
So it was kind of like what you said, where you're just going right through the stages, boom, 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 boom. Oh, boom. okay. So you just shot through, yeah. Yeah. So we had, I don't know, it was like 30 stages, some ridiculous number. He would walk up to each stage, take a look at it for like 30 seconds, mm -hmm. and then, okay, I'm ready, and just shoot. And he jumps in really? with the fast pass. He'd jump in front of everybody. So you got two in a walkthrough and you just do it. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Good. So he'd look at it 30 seconds, jump in, shoot, move on to the next stage. I'm like, I'm not ready yet. Yeah. No, I'm not <laughs> like, ready. How did you do fun. that? Yeah. Yeah. You got to get to a, like, like eventually when you're just done, like memorize the sequences and practice, like, and the more complicated, the better. So like, this is like yes. the overall theme of like practice. Yeah. You, like you totally, totally are on this. Like, if you raise the difficulty of your practice, you want to match and it's easy. So like, if like, I know Eric does a lot of the big course of fire and stuff. I, I do a lot of similar stuff with different restrictions on different like distances and everything. But uh, like, I'll do things where I'm, I have like five different like arbitrary positions. I just made up. All right. Mm -hmm. You know, this cone, or if I brought the cones, cones or this box ammo, this mag, all right. From here you can do this and then reload and then strong hand and then move back in the weekend and then reload and, and then grab this, whatever. So I make these like super complicated sequences because then like these stages are just like, wow, like this is so easy. So it's all about like, you know, you got to put in the work and then uh, then it'll be a lot easier when you do it. That's one of the things I do in my, in my train smart class is, mm -hmm. I will pair people up and then person one gives person two some yes. messed up plan that they would Love never that. do. Yeah. And then they switch. Yes. And the more they mess with each other, the harder it is and the more yes. interesting it gets to watch. Yes, I love that. I love that. No, that's really fun. And uh, yeah, I, I do the exact same thing uh, with just an array and people are, are brutal. They'll, they'll say, all right, this one, this one, reload, strong hand this. Like it, it gets pretty... Uh, pretty technical but then obviously they switch and they have to do each other's plans and remember that and then tell them that so I, I love that it's really good and I actually find that people are more successful when they're doing something outside their comfort zone when their buddy gives them some stupid plan with some ridiculous yes. order because mm -hmm. you have it forces you to visualize so much totally. that they actually get a better time and better hits than when mm -hmm. they shot it the way they wanted to See, that's that those are the little interesting things you find like you're not testing that but you just found that so i, I love those observations like that they're, they're kind of mind-blowing it's like well that just goes to show you need to run through the plan and visualize it because when it's just easy th this actually i love i love this so the technical discussions like i'm i'd say i'm pretty much a uspsa nerd like not actually oh, yeah. like, with the technical stuff so like this is great like this i'm just bouncing all over the place there's so many things going on there's so <laughs> Like there's so many things in shooting that let's like aren't really talked about and I think have helped me a lot and uh but like for example at a stage um uh is in North Carolina area six there was three targets to end close open papers and uh, some of my guys will remember this one's kind of funny I they're all watching and everything and I go up there and I real real technical plan leading up to the end there's three targets right in a row like you know disrespectfully close and I just went ba -ba 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 bang ba -ba bang like I was like oh because I just didn't call it anything because in my mind I was just like real technical, all right, this, 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 and then just finish. And if you ever find yourself just saying, oh, there's three in a row, just whatever, just finish. That's when you're not going to mm -hmm. pick the center and that's when you have problems. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've had a lot of those little like kind of eye-opening moments in the past year, two years of just figuring something out just organically, like through the mistakes. Yeah. And it, it really drives it home. And I think if you're not paying attention, it's very, like I used to not pay attention as much, I guess. Uh, I don't even know, can't really explain it. But now I pay attention. I find these little tools and tricks that have helped me a lot. Something yeah, else. The guys that have like a, sorry, the guys that have like a, a set of like eight ipsic plates. Yeah. That they can see from one, one array. They start shooting the first one, they hit it. The second one, they hit it. They start speeding up the third, fourth. Yes. Speed up on the fifth, and then the last two, they completely miss. Yes, exactly. So like I put oh, more God. emphasis now on the last plates rather than the first plates, like things like that. Yeah. Or like really emphasizing like the center of each plate, not just oh I'm gonna go shoot the rack. Yeah. It's so little things like that. Something else really interesting that I've seen in matches is mm -hmm. when there are a couple of close targets, let's say two targets at five yards and somebody's doing their stage plan and they think, I'm going to shoot those two targets as fast as I can. What their brain yeah. does is thinks, I want to shoot them both at the same time. And they end up shooting at the space now, in between crazy. the two targets because they split the difference. No, I haven't seen that before, but that's crazy. Yeah. No, it was I've seen that place. several times. Jeez. Yeah, that's tough. Uh, yeah, you really hate to see that one. Yeah. <laughs> Such a bizarre thing, the way our mind plays tricks on us. Or you're trying to memorize this memory stage and you skip over the one target that you know exactly where it is that's right, right. in front of your face and don't even engage it. 
Right. Yeah. You're I mean, so I'm, focused on the ones that you don't know for sure where they are. Yeah, exactly. And like the ones that are like right in front of your face, you go by. And then the one that's tucked behind the little corner, you remember. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of memory stages. Like we were just talking about the time limit. I think you should be able to figure out a stage in two minutes consistently. And mm -hmm. if it's not, the stage is too difficult, but uh, yeah. I, or you I need to practice it more. <laughs> when people that throw true, in a memory like, stage. Like, yeah. Oh, if sorry, people throw in a memory stage uh, in nationals, like here's a memory stage, like, okay, that's fun. They'll separate the men from the boys and all that garbage, like, you know. Yeah. But it's like when you have memory stage on memory stage and then another memory stage, it kind of like ruins, it ruins the flow, the ruins the fun of the whole match. Yeah. If you have a stage where the entire day before the match, every single competitor is there for at least 30 minutes or even more than like 15, 20 minutes, like that, there's a problem with that stage. Uh, so I don't really like the, mem the memory stage. Like, oh, every stage is memory stage. That is true. Every stage is memory stage. But when targets are like hidden and tucked behind things, it's like very confusing. That's not necessarily like a stage that's going to test people. I mean, I guess it tests the school of can you memorize a stage, but you do that anyways. And I, I don't really like them as much, but they can be fun. I like shooting them at local and regional matches and, or local and maybe state matches. But as far as regional and national matches, I think <clears throat> pretty straightforward, uh, you know, with some options, right? I like options. They're pretty cool. Honestly, I would be fine if there was no options on stages. It was just who has the best skill and ability on this stage and who can deliver. I'm fine with that. But I do like options sometimes. They're kind of fun to play around with and play to your strengths. I think having a memory stage in a match is a good thing to test that skill of visualization yeah. and memorization. But yeah, like you said, every single stage in the match, that's not even going to be fun. It's yeah, not worth yeah. we're there for. I agree. I'm probably in the same position, you kind of in the middle. But like the shoot houses and stuff where it's like, the only reason why I did well on it is someone, you know, came up to me and said, I've been here for an hour and this is the best plan. You shoot everything. From You're this talking about Florida. Time. Well, oh, I don't know about Florida. It's like, <laughs> different shoot oh, wait, maybe the Florida one. You know, that shoot house was pretty easy in Florida. Florida was totally fine. I guess the one in 2019 in Utah was like, people were putting hats on top of targets and being like, all right. Oh yeah. That's the one I was thinking hat. of. It, it yeah. was Utah. Yeah. That was, that yeah, was, I shot that, that one good. too. That's real. Yeah, you see that that's where you're like Ipsic because you can't do that and have a legal stage. Yeah. Like. I, I'm like, <laughs> there for it. Yeah. <laughs> so what are your plans for the world shoot for preparation specifically? Yeah, so I'll be working and doing uh doing a bunch of work. Um, but I'll I'll have the days off for the world shoot and that'll definitely be a priority if um if the extreme Euro is happening, I'm going to try pretty hard to make it. It's just a lot of travel time, a lot of time off yeah. from work, which is unfortunate. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'll try to make the extreme Euro, but I got, you know, a bunch of regional matches and stuff. These are easy to make, right? I can fly out after work on Friday and I can shoot the match, hopefully in one day. I prefer one day format because you know, it's an area match. If it's, if it's not more than like 14 stages, and I just want to shoot in one day. Uh, so like, you know, those regional matches are really easy to hit, get me more experience, but one, I want to shoot more difficult matches. And two, I want to shoot against better competitors. Mm -hmm. I tried against the same guys in the U.S. for the past few years, and you'll respect them, and they're really good competitors. Um, but And a lot of the guys I shoot against have beaten a lot of the international competitors, you know, maybe besides maybe one or two guys. Um, but, uh, yeah, I want to shoot against better competitors, more challenging stages. And I'm up for any challenges out there. And, uh, yeah, hopefully you get to the Extreme Euro and the World Shoot. And as far as training goes, uh, I'm just going to make it work. That's kind of always what I've always done is kind of make it work, you know, drive for when I got time, live for when I got time, just, just make it happen. Honestly, like I just don't have time for it, but, uh, time for training sometimes when I'm working and doing school, but I would just wake up at just like terrible hours, like, you know, four or five in the morning, drive over here, grab my guns and go shoot. And so I'll try to shoot more, but I got kind of my whole gun situation sorted out. Got a bunch of guns now where I can train and practice and get a bunch of rounds down range, but just I'm focusing on my individual skills I want to develop I also want to develop you know pushing and doing that stuff we we're talking about and then um you know a few more technical elements I want to toss in there but feeling pretty good got a pretty good base and I, I know not only with my current skill level would more practice make me better I also know that with more practice I could expand my current skills so I kind of feel like there's a there's a range of I'm right here up to here is with practice how much better I can get and then here is unlocking a whole new skill level and so that's basically the goal this year so I'm pretty, pretty excited about it. I mean, just talking about it right now got me you know, real fired up and makes me want to go practice and train and drive farther than I got sitting next to me. So I'm just really excited about all of it. There are going to be a lot of things that are outside of your control that you may have not have had to face before. Mm -hmm. Well, for example, jet lag is going to be one. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Getting there a little early so you can adjust. Mm -hmm. uh, another one I've seen 
at these major matches, especially mm -hmm. in Europe, I don't know about Thailand, but sometimes because of the scheduling, they end up pushing into the evening and they're shooting mm -hmm. in very low or minimal light. Low so light. Okay. I don't know if you've ever practiced in lower light, like as, as the sun is going down or as it's about to come up. Yeah. That I've done might that be worth bit. trying a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, that's how just I was in case. So, the low light. Yeah, so I shot a little bit of that just locally and then at different matches, and it hasn't really affected me. Maybe just through the dot and everything. And then, uh, yeah, I just I'm just ready to to make it happen in general. I mean, I'll do whatever it takes. If it, you know, if I if I think it's gonna help me, I'll, I, you know, if if I'm gonna get four hours of sleep or five hours of sleep and be jet lag, I just won't sleep and go practice and just shoot with no sleep just to get the experience. Obviously, right. I'm probably not gonna do that. But luckily, I've. The more experience I've had, the more well-rounded I feel. Like I showed up to Georgia with like like two or three hours of sleep and shot it, and I've shot sick. That is not conducive to results. Uh, shooting no. sick. Uh, <laughs> that's really bad, actually. But uh, I've shot semi-sick and done well. I've also shot really sick and done very poorly. But now I've put myself uh, through more, you know, hard training and stuff. But some of those things are not in my control. But I think there is a certain uh, like personality type that kind of just like, oh my gosh, like you know. Uh, what happened, my grip screw fell off and, uh, you know, I don't have a replacement. It's not going to affect the, the, the performance at all, but they got it in their head and everything. But right. I've had, I've had some serious gun things in my head while I'm shooting matches. I've had serious like outside factors in my head in matches and it really hasn't affected me much. So I try to like, I try to not be too particular about some things just because, you know, a lot of things are out of my control, but yeah, that's definitely interesting things to consider. And I've thought about a lot of those things about like local food and stuff like that. So I thought about that a little bit, but at the end of the day, like I'm just ready for whatever they throw at me. Like I just, I, it's going to be fine. At the end of the day, it's just going to be fine and we're, we're going to make it work. So I will yeah. tell you as a white person, be careful with the rice. It tastes very good, but <laughs> really backs you up, bring Bring stool softeners. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be prepared. I mean, Shannon talked about eating granola bars and saltines and water. I thought that was hilarious. He, he, he's just ready to make it happen too. I mean, he's a great guy. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to go that crazy with granola bars and everything, but or with the rice, I probably won't. I'll probably stay away from it. Probably just, you know, yeah. eat what I, you know, maybe find an American grocery store, just bring food over or whatever. But I'll, I'll figure that out for sure. And be more planning closer to the event with stuff like that. But would definitely be good. And getting traveled. Don't, eat, and don't like eat the McDonald's in thailand apparently that's like the big no-no of yeah <laughs> i'll try <laughs> no I will, I will um and then also i'm assuming like you've made sure your gun actually works with like off-the-shelf ammo or something that's loaded by someone else yeah so i that i've kind of tried thing. the ely ammunition i tried underpower stuff and like everything in my gun now is very uh you know, just very focused on reliability sake. And I'm not going crazy with springs or extractors or anything like that. Just very consistent, reliable stuff. So it'll work with whatever, basically. And, you know, I've shot brass. I've shot 15 times through my current gun and it's worked just fine. And so I know there's a little bit of tolerance give there that will allow some of that stuff, which is real good. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting consideration. I think all my match ammo though, I'm going to bring with me. Uh, but as far as practice ammo, I think I'm going to buy tie arms or whatever they're trying to do. So yeah, because you'll be going with you? sorry. So you'll be oh, surprised, yeah. like especially with the open guys and the open guns being very finicky on ammo. Even mm -hmm. some of the limited guys like have that, where it's mm -hmm. like they rock up and the match ammo that's provided by the shoot doesn't actually work in their gun. So I would suck. They, the 150 rounds that they were able to bring, kind of that's their match ammo. Yeah, that would suck. I mean, as far as the ammo stuff goes, it would be springs or then extractor tension, depending on the rim size and depending <clears> on the power of the ammo. So like, I feel pretty confident I could mess with that if I had to, but I know that my gun can run minor just barely. So, or, or sort of kind of. So, I mean, I think medium power factor ammo will work just fine. So I think I'm pretty much on that, but, but definitely interesting consideration, but match ammo, I'm going to try really hard to bring all my own. And, and yeah, key to my, uh, my mom and dad, I think are going to the world shoot. So they'll be that's able to perfect that because they're, they're can carry some of your ammo <laughs> in their bags because yes. it's limited to 11 pounds yeah. or 11 I mean, kilograms. 11. Yeah. And I guess the cool thing though, is I've never actually had anyone weigh my ammo before. I'm still waiting for the day that someone weighs my ammo. Maybe that's just because I'm being naive. That I've never flown internationally with guns, uh, but I've never had anyone weigh it. So I don't know. No, it's it's 11 pounds right 11 pounds yeah, yeah. like okay. what if i just put 50 pounds of ammo or let's say i put 20 pounds of ammo i mean are they going to take my ammo and weigh it 
I don't know. Sometimes oh. they do. I have seen it happen. It's pretty rare. So when you travel internationally, mm -hmm. you have to have the gun in a separate suitcase from the ammo. Mm. When you're in the U.S., they can be in the same suitcase. Okay, but in I other countries, they require it be in two separate suitcases. Gotcha. Yeah. So they could weigh it then. But I'd probably put the ammo in. I probably put 11 pounds in something and carry it and be like, this is my match ammo. And then different suitcases and kind of move it around and have it tucked in <laughs> in different places. Yeah, that's what Shet, I do too. Chat to Kira how to, how to break the system. <laughs> yeah. So they, they'll probably send you a form for the world shoot that asks for what kind of gun you have, you know, make, model, serial number, that sort of thing. And some countries also require a list of what you're bringing for ammunition, magazines, yeah. things like that. So just Thailand make sure form. you list all mm -hmm. of your ammo that you're bringing, yep. even if it's divided between multiple suitcases. Yep. So, so that it's listed to get it in and also to get it back out. If you have any extra, you won't be able to take it back with you from a lot of countries if you didn't that have it sense. listed originally. Yeah. Okay. Good, good to know. Yeah, be and good. you'll need a form 4457. If, do you have that yet? I probably do. I, I mean, I luckily with some of the travel stuff, my dad's been very helpful with. So I'm, I'm sure we got that, which would be good. But I'll, I'm not sure to check okay. all the boxes. We have a few little checklists and protocols people sent over for that sort of stuff. So okay. I'm sure it's on there. I just haven't looked over it because the world too keeps getting moved, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we'll Did see. you have any sponsors you want to talk about? Yeah, uh, I really want to talk about my mom and dad who have consistently helped me uh, throughout my shooting career, which has been really awesome. But uh, yeah, I only uh, represent companies that I truly believe in and I really enjoy working with. And uh, so I'm really thankful to all my sponsors and uh, maybe we could just link them at the end of the video or something. But everything I use is something that one, I actually use and I actually believe in. And uh, I would never use something I didn't truly believe in or, or didn't work well with people. So um, yeah, I love everyone that I work with and been, uh, had some really unique opportunities with different companies and really grateful for all that. I love how you think your mom and dad, I was, Grant and I were talking before the show about how his hero is a 21 year old boy and my <laughs> hero is a 24 year old girl, Maria Gushina. <laughs> Oh yeah, she, she's great. I've never met her before, but she's obviously a very, very impressive individual. But yeah, I mean, my mom and dad, uh, I'm not even really talking about, it's like financially supporting me with different gun stuff when I was growing up, uh, but more just like the way they raised me and kind of brought me into support and been supportive of it. I mean, it's not always like a monetary thing. It's their time and effort and energy and support. And uh, so I really appreciate that. That, emo that emotional support can be worth yeah. more than, than dollars. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And it's, it's been pretty cool uh, having that matches. Like I always like tell them like, I'm like, you guys don't need to come to this, but they really enjoy it. And so it's kind of, it's been pretty fun to share those experiences with them. And uh, I know my mom would uh, enjoy if I put a few more points on uh, other competitors before the end. So it doesn't get as tight. She doesn't really enjoy that. Nor do I, <laughs> that her. Um, She's biting her nails. Yeah, no, she doesn't enjoy that as much. I mean, sometimes I, sometimes I kind of like it, but uh, most of the time I'd rather <laughs> just be up by 100, 200 points. So, <laughs> yeah. So is there anything we didn't cover that you did want to touch on today? I'm trying to think. I think you pretty much covered everything. Uh, I guess not really much anymore to talk about. Yeah, I mean, looking forward to the next I, year. Yeah, I want to cover the yeah. showdown of the century that all the international guys are looking forward to. <laughs> you versus eric rafael in open at the world yeah, shoot let's do it i'm i'm ready like i mean like i said I'm, I'm ready for any challenge i can only control the controllables controllable is how i train how i practice how i develop the shooter that i am going to be when i show up on the range and i'm ready for absolutely any challenge i'm ready for you know anyone to come down and shoot any division and uh i mean i'd prefer it to be open but uh no I, I have a lot of respect for eric i think he's an amazing shooter and uh, yeah, a lot of respect for the guy, but um, I think uh, you know, I'm going to do real well and, and I'm ready to compete against anyone anytime with open gun. And I'm just really excited about it. And, uh, you know, obviously very humbled to, you know, shoot, shoot the same stages, shoot with him and shoot against him. And uh, yeah, we good. Uh, I mean, I met him at SHOT Show in, I think, 2019. And we were even talking about shooting each other, shooting against each other back then. And uh, so, yeah, I'm ready for it. That um, Freudian slip there. <laughs> Oh yeah, right. shoot, yeah. Shoot him. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, no, no. Shoot, shoot against him, and uh, you know, shoot with each other at different matches. So uh, no, I'm I'm really excited about it. And yeah, like I said, respect the guy. Uh, you know, we're we'll play fair. You know, play hard for sure. And uh, you know, the the best uh, the best year at that time that moment win. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, and uh, looking forward to kind of display my skills a little bit. Yeah, I don't oh, think there's any USA. lack of respect between. <laughs> I don't think there's any lack of respect between you or Eric. I think you both respect yeah. each other as massively as as, mm -hmm. as shooters. 
and yeah. the entire world is looking forward to seeing kind of that yeah. matchup and and see what the what transpires the youthful yeah. youthful exuberance versus the the old the old lion the experience, experience. <laughs> yeah the experience yeah I mean, yeah, there's there's something to be said about the strengths and weaknesses of both of us. But uh, you know, I keep taking any weakness and just flipping it on it on his head and, and making it a strength. So I'm keep, you know, one of the things I guess the only thing I didn't I kind of talked about. But as far as my skill level kind of fluctuating, I probably have a five percent of what my top skill can be and what it's not with just levels of training can fluctuate. But as far as my hundred percent, my hundred percent is changing every single practice session and like. I, I sometimes I don't feel that way, but you know, when I go to the next practice session and realize what I did better, I'm getting so much better. And there's so many parts of my game that haven't been as refined just because of the training. And there's so many parts of the game that haven't been refined just because I haven't raised the ceiling yet, but the ceiling's not been reached. So I think that's the coolest part. And uh, I'm looking forward to be successful in that challenge and at the world shoot. But as far as just like me, I, there's so much more to grow. And that's a, I guess that's, I'm thinking about like well, why I shoot and different things, but like the personal development and getting better and seeing the results and, and really working for the results really excites me. So uh, I'm excited to get better, train more and, uh, you know, meet all the challenges that come my way. I'm very awesome. excited. Well, thank you. I appreciate see, that. To see this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm of awesome course rooting for the USA. Eric, I love a it. great shooter, yeah. <laughs> but go USA. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, people in the U.S., you know, not everyone in the U.S. really knows Eric, but, uh, you know, I, I, the only international people I've ever talked about have always, always been grumbling about, oh, Eric and Christian shooting open. And so I, I love that sort of stuff. And it gets me all real fired up. And anytime I need a little motivation, I'll just open up Instagram and start scrolling uh, through some of the top competitors and uh, they, they get me right on track. So uh, it's, yeah, it's I think he, he seems excited about it. Yeah, I think I think we're both pretty mutually excited and spurred by each other. So uh, I think it's I think it's a good thing. Well, I'm really I'm personally I'm rooting for you. I really <laughs> I want you it. to beat Eric. <laughs> so you know, all the best. I would not be. I appreciate that. I would not be offended if you're not rooting for me. Uh, anyone? No, I am. I definitely. Am. I I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm working hard and uh, doing everything uh, I need to do to make it happen. The cool thing is, I know exactly what I need to do uh, to win against anyone, not just Eric, but uh, just to win in general. So. Uh, I just got to do that. And that's just up to me and it's my controllable. And, and so I'm really excited. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. This I is think a lot we're going to have to split this into two segments. Oh <laughs> yeah. Good good. Yeah. I had no idea what to expect on this <laughs> podcast, but I was uh, really pleasantly, pleasantly surprised and really enjoyed talking to both of you guys. Yeah. yeah this is I, awesome. Thank you. I really like getting into the nitty gritty about shooting and training and all the, the real stuff. Not yeah, so much. Stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was like, you know, like three, three yeah. math nerds talking, talking right. math. So. <laughs> yeah, which is tough because I wasn't math always wasn't, wasn't my strong suit in school. Is other stuff. So I guess uh, this is you know increasing a weakness again here. So uh, we love to see it. But thanks for having me. No, on. you're very good, thing, guys. Thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Awesome. <laughs>